There are places in the King James Version and other normative Christian Bibles where the numbering of the chapters and verses does not line up with the Jewish Version. I am just going to refer to these as Christian and Jewish Bibles with no disrespect or preference to either. You are probably already aware of this disparity from the book of Psalms, where the Hebrew Bible usually denotes the ascription, that means to whom the psalm is attributed, as verse 1 and the following line in verse 2. In the Christian Bible, they are both included in verse 1. The fact is that the original documents do not have any such chapter and verse delineations, and they were added much later. The Jewish Bible has some divisions built into it, but more in the sense of paragraphs than chapters. Since the year 916, the verses in the Jewish Bible have been indicated according to the cantillation marks, and the end of each verse is clear. Concerning the five books of Moses, the Jews have a long tradition of reading through the text in specific sections over the course of either one year or three years total. In the early 13th century, Archbishop Stephen Langton and Cardinal Hugo de Santo Caro both developed different schemata for systematic division of the Bible. It is a system of Archbishop Langton on which the modern chapter divisions are based. Robert Etienne was the first to number the verses within each chapter, and his verse numbers entered printed editions of the Newer Testament in 1551 and of the Tanakh in 1571. When this numbering was retroactively applied by publishers to the Tanakh, some adaptations were made according to the older tradition associated with that text. If you're interested in the complete history, I will post a link to an excellent article in the notes for this episode. In Genesis 32, this numbering shift is only by one verse, but it provides an interesting scenario. The Jewish Bible shows the chapter beginning with Laban taking leave of his daughters and grandchildren and returning to Padan Aram. The Christian Bible begins the chapter with Jacob going on his way and being met by angels. When does the new phase of Jacob's life begin? When Laban leaves or when he goes on his way? Sometimes something must shift for us to move on, and then we must make the move also. Likewise, this week's story really begins last week. Jacob is met by angels, and he realizes this is Elohim's camp, and he calls it Machanayim. What is this word? The word for camp in Hebrew is machane. It comes from a root, chana, which means to bow down or to set oneself down. It is the root used in modern Hebrew for parking your car, but it is also related to the root for chen, which means grace, as in Noah found grace in the eyes of Jehovah in Genesis 6-8. What has grace got to do with camping? If you ever camped out, you know that it puts an unusual strain on how the family functions. While we are used to certain comforts at home, these are gone and we must make accommodation. At a very big camping experience, such as we might have at Sukkot, you have to be prepared to extend grace to many. Families that do not raise their children the way you do, people that have different ways of expressing the names of God or his Messiah, different traditions of worship, and so on. But this is a special camp, Machanayim. There is a special ending in Hebrew for things which come in pairs. All the dual body parts have this ending, in addition to some other interesting examples. The word for sky, Shemayim, why are there two heavens? And the water, Mayim, why are there two waters? And the word for life, Chayim, why is life double? So Jacob is referencing specifically a double encampment. It is not clear why he chooses this name. Is it because of the angels? Does he see something special in their presence? Is it because he was a human company with him? Perhaps he is making a reference to a concept later presented by Yeshua in Matthew 6.10, on earth as it is in heaven. Thus, this week's Parsha begins, messengers come to Jacob that Esau has 400 men with him. He hasn't seen Esau in over 20 years. And the last word he had about his brother was that Esau was going to kill him. Jacob is very afraid, and we see that he divides his group into two companies. 
He figures that if Esau attacks one, the other can escape. Although here he uses the regular plural and not the special dual form, the intent is the same, two camps. Jacob is looking to cut his losses in the event of disaster. It's peculiar because Yehovah is always dividing things. In Genesis 1-4, he divides the light from the darkness. In Genesis 1-7, he divides the waters above the firmament from the waters below. Aha, there are two waters. Not seven verses later, he divides the night from the day. Somewhat drastically in Genesis 2 is a description of how he divided the Adam, the Adam, the man, into male and female. Later, Yehovah separates Abraham out of Babylon. He separates Isaac from the other sons of Abraham, and he separates Jacob from Esau. We see Joseph separated from the rest of his brothers, and that is included in the prophecies spoken over him by Jacob before he dies and by Moses at the end of his life. In Genesis 49:22, we read, Joseph's brands were won over a wall. And in verse 26, the blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. From Moses' prophecy, Deuteronomy 33:16, For the precious things of the earth and the fullness thereof, for the good will of him that dwelt in the bush, let the blessing come upon the head of Joseph and upon the head of him that was separated from his brethren. The word for separate in both places is unusual. It is nazir, like a Nazarite. What do we know about the Nazarite? A Nazarite vow was made by one of the ordinary people as an opportunity to be set apart, similar to the manner in which the priest is set apart. And where will Joseph be found? Well beyond the wall. Deuteronomy 33:17. His glory is like the firstling of his bullock, and his horns are like the horns of the wild ox. With them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth. And they are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. As time goes by, long after Jacob divides his people into two camps, the people are divided again due to their disobedience before Jehovah. After Solomon's time, the kingdom is divided into north and south, Ephraim and Judah. And Ephraim is carried away into exile some 200 years later. Judah will follow them in exile 135 years after that. What would be the purpose of all this division? We find two different motives hidden behind the action. One is revealed in the laws against mixing. We do not mix fibers in our clothes. We do not mate beasts of unlike kind. We do not plow with mixed kinds. We do not sow fields with unlike seeds. There is actually valid biological reason for all these precepts. If you take linen as your warp and wool as your woof, the wool has more tensile strength than the linen, and it will wear out your linen threads and create a hole in your garment. Plowing with two different beasts under the same yoke will cause the furrow to veer off to one side, as one beast will pull more strongly than the other. Some groups of animals can mate and produce offspring, but they will be sterile. In your garden, some plants will thrive next to other ones, and some will die. If you plant your hot peppers next to your sweet peppers, you will be in for surprise at harvest time. All this is demonstrated for us by the first division, light from darkness. What is John's commentary? Chapter 1, verse 5. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And in chapter 3, verse 19, And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Paul also affirms in 2 Corinthians six fourteen, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? Some things just cannot be together. But there is another reason for the division, and that is to return the two parts to be together. We learn this from the division of the human being into male and female. It is Jehovah's intention for them to return to one another as a completion, so we can learn what it means to be one with the Father and later be his bride. This is what is spoken of in Ezekiel 37, 16, and 17. Moreover, thou man, take thee one stick and ride upon it, 
for Judah, and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick, and write upon it, for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. And join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in thine hand. Furthermore, it states in verse 22 that the result of their completion will be the return to the land. Verse 22, And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them, and they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Katonti mi